Um, I started at university, um, and I did I did Irish as a, um, a, a subsidiary subject, not a main subject, uh, at university in England. Um, and then when I came to live full time uh, in Belfast, um, I started night classes, um, and that was very hard. Um, but eventually, the language got a hold of me, and I couldn't escape. organized it because we think that there's always a need for the Irish language to raise a very strong positive profile about itself and there's always a need for us to ensure that we're not marginalized deliberately uh, within the state um, so we organized uh, the, the march was part of a series of, of activities um, around uh, the umbrella ta the Nielig, which is is very like by uh, the, the campaign that was in the Basque country for okay. the Basque language yes. um, and we were influenced by that um, and we started last year to look at how we could raise the profile, how we could get people to come on board and simply recognise the language and say that the language is a good thing um, and this project was, we, we put the project on our work agenda uh, a year ago but we were very busy in the last year with uh, issues around the Irish Language Act. We were the main organisation working on the Irish Language Act. Um, and so we, do, we weren't able to start on this campaign until before Christmas. But I have to say that the context for the Irish language at the moment is extremely negative. So I think that people felt very strongly that they needed to come out and they needed to show that they support the Irish language and they need to show each other and the state that Irish speakers are here, that we're a, a normal, thriving community, um, and that you know we, we won't accept being marginalised and being um, underfunded and being attacked every every day. So uh, it's a fact that if you look at the North as part of um, the responsibility of the British government or as the British government have in power uh, in the jurisdiction of the North, this is the only part of the, the United Kingdom uh, where there is not uh, domestic legislation for the primary indigenous language. In Wales they have had the Welsh Language Act for over 30 years. In Scotland they've had long-standing domestic pr um, protections and they now also have the Gaelic Act. Um, and uh, it's, it's only here uh, in the north of Ireland that the, the key indigenous language doesn't have any protections. So it, it is obviously about the attitude uh, of uh, the powers and the governments that, that influence what happens in the north of Ireland and of the political parties in the north of Ireland, it obviously comes from that from that because you know Irish is a is an official language in the European Union. It's the subject of protections in legislation in the South. It's only here in this tiny wee corner of these islands that there's no protection. And you're quite right to say that the Good Friday Agreement was the first reference to the Irish language in in policy in the north of Ireland. It was the first positive reference. Um, and we're now 10 years on. Last year we had the St Andrews Agreement which gave a specific commitment from the British government to enact legislation and still we have no legislation. So it's very hard to see how that can possibly come about unless there is bad faith on the part of the British government. The Irish government is not willing for whatever reason at this stage to press the issue with them because they were also signatories to the, uh, to the St Andrews Agreement. And the political parties here who are 
using the Irish language as a means to attack the nationalist community. Um, for their political reasons, they want to continue to do that. Uh, and the nationalist parties who, who make statements saying that they support the Irish language are either not strong enough or for them the Irish language is not a central enough issue for them to do anything about that situation.